to uh, present a paper. So I welcome Gunnel and Pascal that will be speak for five minutes. No, please come here. This should work in one second. Does it work? Yeah, yes, it does. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving us the floor today. We are not on the um, uh, program because I think what prompted uh, your offer um, that we um, make a few sentences shortly uh, about our position on TTIP is the fact that we recently finalized a position. Uh, the EBU is the European Broadcasting Union. Uh, representing public service broadcasters in Europe and in Europe, sorry, and in actually uh, 56 countries. Um, DR in Denmark, SVT, SR in Sweden, ULE, um, but also NRK in Norway, for instance, are members of the EBU. Um, and I'm here together with Pascal, who uh, represents the German broadcaster ZDF. So um, I would simply say, um, focus on a few points of the, the policy note we made and of course uh, if you have questions or if you want to have more um, precise information we'll be happy to uh, distribute this, uh, this note uh, to you. Um, what uh, prompted uh, the need uh, for the EBU to, to, to um, write uh, down such policy note, um, which was actually uh, finalized for last July, so it's very recent. Um, well, uh, this is the need we felt to clarify a number of things in the context of the uh, current negotiations. As, what, uh, as, as was said uh, this morning uh, by Mrs. Kronberg, there is uh, insufficient transparency according to us with regards to the negotiations. And as a result, uh, we, uh, we are uncertain sometimes about what is really being discussed and uh, what uh, uh, the negotiators really have in mind. For instance, we uh, heard that the US uh, already during the second round of the negotiations in November last year uh, asked the Commission whether they would be able to negotiate or discuss audiovisual services. And later on, they went on uh, uh, during further rounds um, and asked the uh, European Commission what exactly would be covered by um, the audiovisual services, what would not be, and whether the audiovisual media services directive would be an appropriate um, basis or framework for defining the scope of audiovisual services. And the answer to that is no, according to us, because the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which is the main regulatory framework for audiovisual services um, at EU level, um, is different from the classification that is usually uh, used by the WTO. And that classification includes, for instance, radio or um, uh, theatrical uh, releases, uh, so theatrical, um, sorry? Yes, theaters actually. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, that that are not uh, covered by the uh, AVMS directive. Um, but uh, what also prompted uh, this uh, this note um, is the fact that we are not, according to us, in front of um, a traditional, usual uh, FTA agreement in the sense that, first of all, it is the US we are dealing with and the US have not ratified the UNESCO Convention um, and the US uh, have a very different uh, background and, uh, and the policy scheme when it, when it comes to culture and audiovisual services as compared to the EU. And the second, second thing is that it is supposed to be a deep and comprehensive uh, agreement with notably a regulatory chapter, which is a horizontal chapter that will cover every sector and how uh, the uh, status of audiovisual services will be dealt with under that uh, chapter is not, is not clear uh, to us. And the last thing is that we, uh, as Ségolène uh, mentioned, we uh, are now in a, a digitally driven economy already um, and uh, technological convergence of platforms, of devices, needs to be taken into account as well. So. Um, when the US or even the European Commission clearly says 
um, be reassured that subsidies, quotas, will not be touched. That's a good thing, but that is not enough. Um, in fact, uh, we need to be sure that uh, audiovisual services taking the form of streaming uh, video on demand, um, uh, being distributed onto social platforms, etc., etc., uh, over the top services as well, will be considered uh, fully as audiovisual services. And um, that's, I think, uh, one of the main points we wanted to make. Um, we also know that the US wanted to recently to, to, to discuss the possibility of introducing digital products uh, in the future agreement. Digital products as something separate, apparently, from audiovisual services. But audiovisual services, most of them may soon be actually uh, classified as digital product and then uh, how to ensure that the uh, exception that is uh, stated in the mandate is effective and complete and future-proof. So in sum, what we want is that we have a complete and future-proof exclusion of audiovisual services that takes into account all these new challenges. And uh, we think that in addition to uh, having this explicit exclusion, it would be um, necessary to have as a complement uh, an explicit statement in the, in the agreement itself, um, ensuring that both the EU and member states can continue to develop their uh, audiovisual policies uh, in full sovereignty and that they can continue to protect and promote cultural diversity, media pluralism, uh, and uh, uh, cultural policies in general. And I will uh, very quickly uh, give the micro to, to Pascal, because uh, Germany has been particularly active recently uh, on this issue, and with some, with some results, I think, so uh, maybe you have a, a message to deliver. <laughs> Short America, yeah, a few encouraging words uh, because uh, some of you might know that the situation in Germany is similar when it comes to the federal government level as the one you are facing in, uh, in all Scandinavian countries. We have a government, federal government, which is very much export oriented. Uh, Mrs. Merkel governments uh, were initiated the, the process with the Obama administration very much. And, uh, and Germany is an export nation. So we know what it means to hear that there are more important things to us. And uh, uh, we have cars to export, but not much culture, obviously. Um, however, um, we, we managed to get um, um, considerable support from the German lender. And as you know, the German lender are in charge of cultural and media policies and not the federal government uh, who is in charge of trade policies. And um, the German lender uh, demanded, with our support, of course, very clearly the exception um, uh, of um, cultural and individual services uh, before the mandate battle, which we talked about last year. And the mandate um, the minister referred to this morning was obtained just thanks to one nation. Um, so we are still very cautious about its, uh, its, its value, even though the, the, the content we fully back, of course. And um, so just to tell you that it is worth uh, um, organizing a public debate about the issue and uh, I think what the, the German first ministers, the 16, uh, who uh, openly wrote to Mrs. Merkel, made very, very clear that um, for them, what is at stake in this treaty, which is not a normal free to F to a FTA treaty, is um, cultural sovereignty, amongst other things. Um, and we, we would be signing a treaty with the country which does not recognize the legitimacy of cultural policies and never had cultural policies like we have them in Europe. So if you uh, uh, sign a treaty with a country, uh, a treaty which is supposed to be the blueprint for future world treaties, it was also referred to this morning, you have to be very, very cautious about the principles on which it is based. And I think that um, the, um, the 
the, the work done by the, the German political levels and also by the cultural uh, um, cultural coalitions um, f finally impressed the federal government very much because this summer in the Sommer interview, which is a German tradition, politicians have been interviewed in the summer um, from their supposedly holiday place, uh, Mrs. Merkel uh, beside um, consumer rights and environmental uh, policies mentioned cultural diversity under the non-negotiable um, chapters. So it is clear to be, it is still to be seen what exactly falls under it, but it is, um, it is possible to, 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 to organize and it is necessary to organize a public debate because um, the, the, the Nordic countries as we see them are extremely proud of their social fabric and the way society is organized and works. And it is not possible to have a social fabric without cultural policies. And uh, the, so it is, it is also very much about fundamental principles being negotiated or non-negotiated. Uh, and and I, I think that it is worth um, trying again and again to uh, influence governments from that point of view. Because once you really make them talk, once you push them into the corner, uh, they get into difficulties when they pretend that uh, that project is just an FTA agreement with no danger for the future. Because the really important thing in that chapter is chapter two on regulatory harmonization. Thank you very much.